Hello, Kim. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Good evening to you, Rina, from the other side of the world. It's always a pleasure mm -hmm. to talk to you. Thank you so much for doing the work that you're doing and for bringing about a change in the lives of all of us as professionals and parents too. So thank you for existing. <laughs> so I want to say the same to you, by the way. <laughs> thank you to you for all that you bring to the families to the clinicians and to the beings around you as you continue to move in your mission of evolving the conscious evolution of the human spirit. Thank you, Kim. Kim, when you talk about feeling safe, feeling safe, you know, parents would feel we keep our kids safe, you know, we take care. I mean, what do we mean by feeling safe? That word, you know, there's a depth to which to that word safe which i think not everyone knows would you be able to share what feeling safe and what does that emotional safety mean when we are following a home program or when we are with our kids you know as therapists i i'm so glad you asked that question i struggled with that myself uh, when i worked in the arctic of canada with the inuit uh, children of Canada. My husband used to use that word all the time. Kids don't feel safe. And I thought, well, they have a house. Some of them, they have food, they come to school. I had this idea of what safety was. Safety is a perception. And in the words of Dr. Stephen Porges, it's a neuroception that the brain, especially the brainstem, which is like a centimeter above your spinal cord, is like a radar screen. Constantly, constantly, even when you're sleeping, monitoring the environment for threat. And threat is in tone of voice, it's in a look, it's in my body language, it's in a sound outside my window. It is coming into the brain at these primitive levels. And if I, as the perceiver, lock on to that as danger, I can get stuck there. And that house that I live in, and that food that I eat, and that school that I go to doesn't benefit me because that underlying perception of stress and threat is the backdrop through which I live in the world. And so it's about learning as a parent to feel into, notice, wonder, is my kiddo stressed? Is my kiddo tuning out? Is my kiddo angry? Is my kiddo struggling with sleep? Is my kiddo withdrawing? These are the pieces that are the signs that neuroception might not be in a settled state of safety. Yeah, that, that, that is really helpful. I just wanted to share something, Kim. You know, my husband went through a big surgery and in that moment, you know, my son studies, he's an average student. But in that moment, when I told him that, you know, Baba will go through this surgery, I'll be with him for a week and then we'll be back home. He was like, will you, be, will you come back? Will Baba come back? He will be, will he be in the ICU? And, you know, he, he was feeling unsafe. You know, we, I explained to him. My husband explained to him, he was under the care of his grandparents, both the sides, you know. He was taken care of, he had the house, he had everything. But after my husband was discharged and we were back home, he was not participating in the class. He would just sit and just stare away, you know, not, not be there. As in, and you know, his grades were falling, he was not interested in studies and I was wondering what's going wrong. I, 
you know i know everything but in that moment to realize oh god you know he is going through a trauma which he is not able to express and he was feeling unsafe so what i'm trying to i mean you know it may look like a behavioral issue because i actually thought oh god his grades are suffering he's not studying oh this way from my end i thought i was doing my best and i i did my best but from his end one day he said you just left me you just left me and you went with baba for one full week i was all alone i said your grandparents were there he's like yeah but i was all alone you know and that felt unsafe for him and that, the the repercussions you know the they stayed with him for full 2 3 months to the point when i spoke to the teachers they were like he's just withdrawn he's not talking he's not interacting you know so it may look as if you know it's just a behavior but feeling unsafe i mean i just thought i should share this you know because i i think that both myself and the audience are deeply grateful for your example nothing is more terrifying for a child than the potential loss of a parent and even if it's structured and organized and it's the idea that you might not come back is terrifying and what you also shared in your story was the repair we there are events like this one that we cannot avoid they have to happen and we can prepare our children for them as best as we can and they still will be a rupture in their feeling of safety what gives us resilience is not avoiding these things it's weathering them coming out on the other side and realizing that i can survive life's challenges so thank you for the gift of your story and your beautiful family and how your son was so elegantly able to articulate how he felt alone and how that reconnection restored his faith that it's going to be okay and yeah and if my child can feel that i'm sure any child who's neurodiverse who can't express goes through it you know and that is all that shows up in behaviors we may have a social story we may have a visual schedule but he's still trying to make sense of things and and that's about it so thank you so much for ex- explaining feeling safe you know it it is wonderful i also heard you talk about conscious parenting what 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 is that term as in you know conscious parenting what does it mean i feel somewhere we are all conscious we are all trying to do the best so i mean i would love you if you could explain more on what that means sure i've also heard you talk about conscious parenting so this is yet another aligned passion that we have well consciousness what does consciousness mean to me consciousness means increasing my connected awareness to some aspect of myself and the world that i was not aware of a moment ago So this is a moment by moment elevation of putting my mind into an alert focus state around myself in relationship to the world around me. So consciousness isn't a static thing and it's highly highly interrupted by stress by speed by pressure by fear and in in a way it is the antidote to those things that as i become more conscious especially as a parent what it allows me to do is soften the intensity of my anxiety pause into into curiosity and to respond instead of react to the interactions that i'm having with my child and this is in my view 
how we shift away from transmission of transgenerational patterns of ways of interacting with our children that may come from a trauma history to an evolved, more responsive, reflective, empowering way of being with our children. I think our children are our best teachers. I just want to share something, Kim. You know what? I was aware of that I have to be a conscious parent, I think, ever since my child was three years old. Before that, I was actually doing what my mom was doing. And I'm not blaming my mom. She was doing the best that she could. But, you know, I was actually what she was, you know, just shouting and getting angry and all. And so when my son was three years, I was very conscious and I'm working really a lot on myself. He's 12 now. I still see myself slipping into those patterns and they come more, you know, like this, they come really easy for me. And to work on becoming conscious is a process it is definitely better, but it's taking time. Does that happen to everybody? And I'm sharing this because, you know, it shouldn't mean that, you know, like whatever concepts that you told me, moment to moment awareness, responding instead of reacting, but reacting always comes in. Then I apologize and I'm like, I'm sorry, you know, I did what I did to my child. But what I'm trying to say this and why I'm saying this is because it is a process. It won't happen. Like, you know, I learn it today and then the next day I am like an evolved parent. Do you agree with this? What are your views about it? I'm, I'm giggling as you say it because uh, as I move into uh, elder land here and I have an adult child, it's a process that continues to evolve. Maybe, maybe, maybe my grandchildren may have the benefit of some of the wisdom of that parenting journey, but it is a never ending opportunity. And there is something in you said that was important that I wanted to capture, and that is the repair. It is way more important to focus on the repair than it is to do it right in the first place. Because in, re in life, relationships are about struggle and reunion. And if we don't have ruptures that get repaired, we don't learn how to do that. So part of conscious parenting is actually being compassionate to yourself when you mess up as a part of engaging in the active learning with your child when you come back to the relationship and restore it to a space of security. That is the heart of conscious parenting, not being perfect. Yeah, thank you so much for saying that because I feel it's a, it's a, it is a big job. You know, when I see my son triggering me, even now, and when I am compassionate towards myself and I am a little stern towards him, I, f I f go into feeling guilty and then I have to tell myself, it's okay, Rina, it's okay, Rina. And why I'm sharing this publicly, it's because this is what we all go through as parents, and especially if the child has and is neurodiverse, it is difficult. And as you said, it's not about being perfect. It's just about being conscious. So thank you. Our workshops at Relationship Matters are in a blending of multiple interactive topics. And a couple of our favorites are trauma-sensitive practice, autism matters, eating and feeding matters, sleep matters, becoming a behavioral detective, just to name a few, but those are the powerhouses, I feel, of the work that we've been doing over the past two years.